Well, here we are in the midst of another great day. Thanks for taking a minute to tune in. And I know I say this every day when I'm on here, but I truly mean it. I don't take it for granted that you would stop by, take a minute, tune in, and hear what the Spirit of God has to say. Wow, Jason, you might say that's really bold of you to say that the Spirit of God is going to say something through you. Well, I'm a child of God. And if you've received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you're a child of God too and can be a vessel for His voice. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and He wants to use our hands to touch other people. He wants to use our feet to go and do what He tells us to do. And He wants to use our mouth to preach the gospel, to teach the good news, to comfort others, to strengthen others, to teach others, to mentor others, to comfort others. As a child of God, that's what we're called to do. He tells us in the Great Commission, go into all the world, teach and preach the good news, heal the sick, deliver those that are oppressed by demons. We have a mandate by Jesus to be used by him. So yes, I believe the Spirit of God will minister to us today through His Word as I share what He has put on my heart to share. And we've been looking at how God has designed, engineered, and created mankind. And He's created us to be just like Him. And he's done that because he's a three-part being. He's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are a three-part being. We've looked at this before. We are a spirit. We have or possess a soul, and we live in a body. That's how God has made us. And lately, we've been exploring one component of our soul, which is our imagination. Many times, people interchange the word spirit with soul. Like when you hear that a, an aircraft has gone down and they'll say there are so many souls on board. Well, that's true, but there's that many spirits and there's that many bodies because each of us have three parts. Who we really are is a spirit, just like our Heavenly Father. We're made in His image. The Bible says He is a spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So we're made in their, His image. We're a spirit too, but we possess a soul which is made up of our mind, our will, our emotions, our memory, and our imagination. And if you've been tuned in to these broadcasts, you probably can quote that yourself. And we've taken an extensive look at all of these, and I encourage you to go back and check those out, whether it be on our YouTube channel, uh, other broadcasts on Hopestream Radio, or whether it be on our website or on Facebook, tremendous amount of valuable revelation. And so today we want to continue exploring in the time that we have on imagination, our imagination. And if you were with us in our previous broadcast, we discussed that our imagination was given to us by God. It's not something that is just supposed to be used by children who are using it in their playtime or using it as a coping mechanism by creating an imaginary friend. No, God has given us an imagination because I believe He Himself has an imagination. And our imagination is our ability to recall images from the present or create images from the future, whether they're real or not real. And we've taken a look at the difference between fantasy and the proper use of our imagination and faith. And I simply said to you that fantasy is using your imagination on the basis of something other than the truth of God's Word. So when we're talking about animation, when we're talking about Disney World, and we're talking about um, all the things that could be in the fantasy realm, science fiction, yeah, that's fantasy, and those things can be enjoyable to view and to partake in. But really, our imagination is to be used in our faith walk. 
And yesterday I said something that I think is valuable enough to repeat. And I said that our imagination is an environment on the inside of us as a part of our soul or our heart, as you would say. It's an environment to catch a new reality from the word of God. And I want to build on that today in today's episode, which is called Still Part of That Imagine That series. But today's episode is Can You Conceive It? Can you conceive it? Have you ever heard somebody say, I can't even conceive that? I can't even conceive that. I can't imagine that. I can't even fathom that. I can't wrap my brain around that. Can't wrap my mind around that. I can't conceive that. Well, God has made you to conceive his word. And he's made you to do that in your imagination. And that's what we want to build on today. Why is our imagination so important? Well, because it helps us conceive things. And that's what I want us to see today. We took a look at Psalm 103, 14 before, but I want to build on it. Psalm 103, verse 14 says, For God knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. And I emphasize that word frame because when you look it up in the original Hebrew, that word frame does mean frame, just like you would frame up a house. Or a recipe is a frame. It's guidelines. It's a structure that determines the outcome. Anybody that's done any baking, and for those of you who may not know, my wife Pam is actually a cookie artist who makes these unbelievable works of art in sugar cookies using a royal icing. But she has a framework to get to the end result. If you want it to taste right, look right, have the right consistency, the end result requires a frame. And the recipe is that frame. You go outside of it and use not enough flour, too much flour, not enough salt, too much salt, leave out the salt. It's going to end up somewhere else than you desired it to be. Matter of fact, our girls the other day were making some chocolate chip cookies. They know their dad loves chocolate chip cookies. They went through the whole process, mixed it all up, put in the chocolate chips, stuck it in the oven and baked it, and it came out a mess that had to be thrown in the garbage. Nowhere near the end result they were looking for. Why? They didn't follow the framework. They forgot the flour. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what that looked like? Can you see it? It was a blob that they had to throw away in the garbage. Why? They didn't follow the framework. So we're made with a frame, and God knows our framework. But what is our framework? When you look it up in the original Hebrew, that word frame also means imagination. And that's what we looked at in our previous episode. But today I want to show you that that word frame, or yetzer, in the original Hebrew also means conception. Wow. Do you see how much revelation you can get by digging into the word, by looking up the Strong's Concordance, looking up the original Hebrew or the original Greek? If we were just to read Psalm 103, 14, we would say, yes, God knows our frame. He knows how we're made up. He remembers that we're dust. But we wouldn't understand that God has made our framework to be our imagination. He used our imagination as the starting point and framed everything else that we are around our imagination. Why? Because your imagination is your spiritual womb. That's a big statement. Let me say that again. Your imagination is your spiritual womb. Now, in the natural, only women have a womb. They have been given by God the opportunity to birth mankind into existence, into this earthly realm. And what an amazing process that is. 
and a miraculous one. But as children of the Most High God, males and females are to conceive things and birth them into the natural realm. Now, I understand this may be very foreign to those of you who have tuned in. And if this is your first episode, whether you're watching it after it's recorded or now, it could be very, very unusual. So I encourage you to go back and see the previous episodes. However, God's word doesn't just automatically come to pass. It wasn't that way when you got born again. It was God's desire for you to get born again. It was his will. He made it available. Jesus paid the price, but God didn't just do it. Whose responsibility was it to get born again? Ours. We had to catch a truth from God's word. He wants me saved. Doesn't want me to go to hell. Jesus has paid the price for me to be born again. He paid the price for all my sins. And then he set up the method by which we are to receive it. Believe it in your heart. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Follow Jesus in his ways. And when you do, you receive the promise that God had made available to us. Well, how do we do that? We conceived it on the inside. We caught a truth that we saw in the word of God or we heard preached. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. We hear a truth. It has to become real in our imagination, the way we see things, the way we see ourselves, the way we see our future. We have to take that word and plant it in our imagination. Because yet, sir, is our framework. It's our imagination. That same word also means conception. It's where you conceive things. What is conception? That is when life begins. Just because God said something in his word doesn't mean it automatically comes to pass and doesn't mean it comes alive to the reader or to the hearer. We have to accept that seed. The Bible calls the word of God a seed. We have to accept that seed. We have to plant it in our heart. Remember, our heart is our soul. It's our imagination. We have to plant the word of God and we have to conceive it. We have to allow it to come alive on the inside of us. How does it do that, Jason? Well, we allow the word of God to paint a picture on the canvas of our imagination. And when we do, it then becomes our new reality once we nurture it and water it, meditate on it and allow it to become big on the inside of us. So with that understanding, what I read the other day, I can finish reading the last part. Your imagination is an environment, a spiritual womb where conception takes place. It's an environment to catch a new reality from the word of God. To allow it to grow and develop, to water it, to nurture it until it becomes so big It has to come out. (laughs) Doesn't that remind you of the birthing process in the natural? That when a woman gets pregnant, ever before she ever feels anything in the natural, before she ever sees anything in the natural, she starts saying what? I'm expecting. Based on what? A test, perhaps? A word from the doctor? We take a word from a test or a word from a doctor, and before we ever see anything, before we ever feel anything, we're expecting. And it's the same thing in the kingdom of God. We have to understand that whatever you're expecting, you prepare for, right? When a woman is pregnant, what does she do? She starts nesting. Got to get the nursery ready. Got to start buying clothes. Get the diapers ready. Start doing everything that I'm not able to do once the baby gets here. Let me take care of some things around the house. Even the husband starts to prepare. Let's, uh, with us, we had to get a dishwasher installed because for our second, we didn't want to continue washing bottles by hand. So let's rip out this cabinet. Let's get a dishwasher installed. We start to prepare because we're expecting. And it's the same thing when we believe God's word. 
when we receive it, the seed of his word. We plant it in the womb, spiritual womb, which is our imagination, where we can close our eyes and we can actually see his promise coming to pass in our life. And I submit to you, this is really where many believers today are missing it. They might have scripture memorized, but just because you can recite scripture doesn't mean it's real to you. Wow. Let me say that again. Just because you can recite scripture doesn't mean it's real to you. It hasn't become your new reality because you haven't planted the seed of that word in your spiritual womb, which is your imagination. You have to see yourself enjoying the promises of God before you'll actually enjoy it on the outside. Your imagination is your spiritual womb. I want to take a look at something in the time we have left in Mark chapter 4, which is the parable of the sower. And if we start with verse 14, it says here that, of course, let me just set it up. Jesus is explaining the parable to his disciples. He's already told the parable and they didn't quite understand it. And so he now explains what he meant by the parable of the sower. And in verse 14, he says, the sower sows the word. So right there, we can see that in the kingdom of God, the way Jesus looks at things, the way God the Father looks at things, the way the Holy Spirit looks at things, the word of God is a seed that is to be sown. Okay, so how do you sow this seed? He goes on to tell us. The sower sows the word, verse 15, and these are they by the wayside. So he starts to tell us about all the different types of ground that the seed can be sown into. Well, what's the ground? Our spiritual womb. What's our spiritual womb? Our imagination our framework. It's how God has designed us. That's why we dream. Not to have nightmares. Nightmares are what the adversary does to twist the good thing God has given us in dreams. We're to dream the word of God coming to pass in our life. That's the reason he's given us the ability to dream and to daydream and to imagine. Not to imagine vain things or evil things, but to imagine his word coming to pass for me personally, not someone else. Yes, Lord, I can see that happening to my neighbor. I can see that happening to my aunt. She is so spiritual, loves Jesus, goes to church every week. I can see her getting that promise. I can see her getting healed. But me, you're not there yet. You haven't allowed the truth of his word to be planted into the ground or the spiritual womb of your imagination. You have to see it coming to pass for you. That's how you got born again. You saw Jesus paying the price for your sins personally. So you accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior and you received his promises personally. It's the same thing with every other promise. Promise of peace, joy, strength, healing, prosperity, amen, in every area of our life, promotion, elevation, influence, all the things he wants us to experience to equip us to do more for his kingdom. But we have to first see it on the inside, on the spirit of our imagination. I'm going to say it again. Your imagination is your spiritual womb. It's where you harbor promises of God on the inside before you get to experience them on the outside. But not everybody participates in the incubation process, in the growth and development process, just like when in the natural women are having a baby. The seed is planted in their womb, but things can happen. Where... The seed can be aborted, can die if it's not protected, if injury takes place, if it's not nourished properly, on and on and on. And we see that here in Mark chapter 4. He says, the sower sows the word, and then he talks about these different grounds. And this is what I want to show you in our closing minutes. Verse 15, 
And these are they that by the wayside, when the word is sown, sown where? In their spiritual womb, their imagination. They hear the word of God preached or they see it in the Bible. But when they've heard it, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that is sown in their hearts. Well, he's not sowing the word in their blood pump. Your heart is your soul. If you work up, if you look up that word heart in the original Greek, it talks about cardia. It talks about your innermost being, your soul, your imagination, your mind. The word of God must be sown into your spiritual womb or your imagination because words create pictures. You have to picture God's word coming to pass in your life and you have to protect it because Satan wants to come after it and rip it out. So this is an example that might someone might hear the word. They might be browsing by my video. They might hear something. They might catch it for a, sa a second. Then Satan will whisper a lie to them or send someone across their path that says, well, that stuff isn't true. And then they just dismiss it just as quickly as they heard it. And it doesn't have the opportunity to take root in their imagination. They can't see that word coming to pass for them personally because Satan steals it out with a lie. Well, you know you don't deserve that promise from God. Remember how you acted last week? Remember how you spoke to your wife yesterday? And so on and so on and so on. So they dismiss it. And they allow the adversary to steal that promise right out of their imagination. The seed doesn't have a chance to take root. Just like the next type of ground or heart condition, imagination condition, verse 16. And these are like those, in other words, people, when the word is sown on stony ground, when they have heard the word, they get excited. They receive it with gladness, verse 17, but they don't have no root in themselves. And so they might endure for a little time, but afterwards when affliction and persecution comes, for the word's sake, immediately they get offended. Well, let me ask you a question. Who is it that gets offended? Babies get offended. Children get offended. If you're somebody that gets offended easily, it's just an area of immaturity in your life. I'm sorry to be so bold. I love you. I'm telling you this in love. We've all been offended over things. It's just an area of our life we need to grow up in. So if we get offended, it's because we're not mature in that area. And though someone might preach it, we might see it. We don't accept it in our spiritual womb. We don't accept it into our imagination. And we might get excited about it for a second. But as soon as someone else comes along and says something or we get under pressure, we get offended and we throw away that image that the word of God wants to paint on our imagination. We can't see ourselves doing that anymore. For instance, you may have a desire. God may have spoken to you personally that I want you to become a missionary. I want you to go to Central America and preach God's word. And you're like, yes, I'm going to do that. I love it. And then as soon as hard times come, no one believes in your call. You start telling people and they say, well, you're not qualified to go preach. What Bible school did you go to? What degree do you have? And all of a sudden you get offended. The money isn't coming in. People talking bad about you. No one wants to support you. No longer do you see yourself becoming a missionary. You abort the seed that God wanted to plant in your spiritual womb, your imagination. You can't see yourself doing it anymore. So it won't come to pass. Verse 18. And these are they which are sown among thorns. So the word of God is being sown, but there's already wounds, hurts, pains, belief systems already in our heart, our mind, our imagination. We think a certain way. You know, there's many people out there that don't believe God heals today. Or if he does heal, it's just the ones he picks. So if you've been raised in that, and if that's what you're taught, if I come along and say, it's always the will of God to heal everyone of everything, every time right now, you may not receive that. It, it bumps up against the thorns that are already in your mind, in your imagination. So you can't conceive it. You can't see God healing you personally because of the way you've been taught. So it says here in verse 18 that when you hear the word, 
Verse 19, the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things, they enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Now, the seed is the same. The word of God is the same in all of these areas, but it's the type of ground. What am I talking about? Your spiritual womb. What's the condition of your imagination? Can you see yourself being healed? Because many of us have been suffering with something for so long, that becomes our reality. The pain becomes the reality. The limitation becomes the reality. The lack of mobility becomes the reality. What the doctors have said, the medication becomes the reality. Those things are fine, but if we're locked into that, we won't be able to conceive the scripture that says, by his stripes, you are healed. He is the God that takes the sickness from the midst of you. Healing is the children's bread. He is our shepherd, we shall not want, and on and on. The promises of our he being healed and having well-being will be choked out by what you already know by your experiences, by the thorns that are already in your imagination. Now, that doesn't mean it's not impossible. We just have to give ourselves to the saturation of the teaching of the word. We have to allow the word of God to pull those thorns out of our imagination and our memory and our mind. In other words, those past experiences, the hurt and pain, to pluck up everything that's out of there. Stir that ground up so that when you do hear an anointed word, you receive it with gladness. It gets deeply rooted. You start to water it. And what happens is you get to experience verse 20. These are those in which the word of God is sown into good ground, a good spiritual womb, an imagination that can conceive it coming to pass for them personally. They hear the word and they receive it and they bring forth fruit. What fruit? The fruit that the word produces. There's power in the word to bring it to pass. And it says it goes on to produce 30 fold, 60 fold and some hundred fold. So we can uproot wrong teaching, hurts and pains, wrong perspectives, but we have to allow the purity Psalm 119, the word of God is very pure. It's so pure that it'll purify toxic environments, toxic imagination, toxic memories, toxic perspectives and ways of thinking. But you have to overdose on the word of God. You have to put more of it in you and allow the Holy Spirit time to get you to think differently, see differently, act differently, speak differently so that verse 20 can come to pass that you can take the word of God and that you can plant it in your heart and you can protect it, water it, nourish it till it takes root, till it grows so big on the inside of you. This is your new reality. Yes, everything on the outside doesn't look like it's coming to pass. Everything on the outside and everyone are talking the opposite, but I have a new reality. I am healed. I'm no longer an asthmatic. I no longer need medication. I don't need my inhaler. I'm not allergic to dust and molds. That became so big on the inside of me that when I got around dust and molds, it didn't bother me anymore. That was a process. The reality of God's word has to be conceived and nourished and grow in your spiritual womb, your imagination, until the point it gets so big, you don't have any other opportunity or choice than to have that thing birthed into your natural reality. That's how spiritual manifestation takes place. Now, that's the main way God wants it. Of course, there are miracles and God does things through anointed men and women of God. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you living a victorious life by allowing the word of God to become your new reality by planting the word into your spiritual womb. Remember, he says here in Psalm 103 that he knows our frame. He knows our imagination. That word imagination, our framework, the way we're built, that same word means conception. He knows how we conceive truth. And our reality is conceived either by accepting the world's information and planting it in our spiritual womb and allowing that to be birthed, where we're limited, we're lame, 
we limp along in life or we allow the truth of God's word to be planted. That becomes our reality and we birth that into our life. That's the way the kingdom of God works, whether you believe it or not. Or not. Proverbs 23 and 7 says this, For as a person thinks in their heart, in your soul, the way you process, the way you see, the way you receive information and make it real on the inside, that's what you become. I want to show you this in closing. If you actually take a look at verse 26 of this same Mark 4 chapter, this is the way the kingdom of God works, whether we like it or not. He goes on in 26 and says, and he said, so is the kingdom. This is the kingdom. He's explaining this is the way the king op kingdom operates. The kingdom of God is as if a man should cast seed into the ground, the word of God planted into your spiritual womb, your imagination. And this farmer would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up. He doesn't know how, but look at verse 28. For the earth or your spiritual womb, your imagination, it brings forth fruit, either good or bad. What are you meditating on? What are you allowing in your heart? The Bible says guard your heart because out of it comes the issues of life. He doesn't know how, but he goes to bed, he wakes up, and that earth will bring forth fruit of herself. First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. It's a process. You have to give this conception process time to work. But my question is this, what seed are you receiving? Are you receiving the truth of the world that might be factual? Does that become your reality? What others have said about you or done to you? Do you rehearse that and replay that in your imagination, in your memory? Do you lay down at night in your bed and replay all the bad things people have said to you and done to you? If so, you're allowing what they have said to be planted into your spiritual womb. It becomes your reality and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You will stay right there limited based on what they had to say. Don't let people contain you. Don't let them hold you back and hold you down based on their limited and futile perspective. Why not take what God says, how he sees you, what he has said about you? Well, Jason, I don't know. That's why we get in the word of God. That's why we listen to teachings like this. So we can catch a new image of who we are in Christ. We can have an accurate representation and an understanding and revelation of our identity in Christ. And then we can start to conceive these things on the canvas of our imagination, our spiritual womb. So we can now enjoy a new reality, despite what we've experienced years and decades before. We can watch God's word come to pass right before our very eyes. But to us, it's not a surprise because it's been alive and real to us on the inside the entire time. Amen. Wow. I hope that was a blessing for you. I thank you for letting me uh, go a little bit beyond our time today. Uh, I know that normally I say 20 to 30 minutes, but I've stopped saying that because I'm just going to teach until I can bring it to a close. I really, really, really want everyone who sees this to catch this. I really believe this is what's hindering many believers today. They read the word, but they don't see it coming to pass for themselves. You have to be so convinced, fully persuaded. What God says is for me, I can have it, and I can see it on the inside. That has to be so real that when pressures and pain and persecution from the outside try to come in, it doesn't move you. Because I believe the word of God above those things. And what I see on the inside of me, it's more real than what's coming against me on the outside. Listen, Pam and I love you. 
Uh, it's our hopes that tomorrow we can come before you together and give you an inside look at Depoy Ministries and our lives. We like Fridays. Fridays are a chance for us to just be a little bit more relaxed and allow um, you to see what we're doing in the ministry and get a little backstory on who we are and why we're doing this. So we hope you'll join us. But until then, let's believe God. Let's allow ourselves to dream big based on his word. Let's seek him for the plan he has for our life and allow that to be the new image on the inside of us. And then let's walk in victory, giving God all the glory all the time. You guys enjoy your day.